do hyper local gift economies turn the market economy on its head and could that destroy society as we know it <laughs> um, we're asked that a lot Welcome to the Best New Ideas in Money, a podcast from MarketWatch. I'm Stephanie Kelton. I'm an economist and a professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University. And I'm Charles Passy, a reporter at MarketWatch. Each week, we explore innovations in economics, finance, technology, and policy that rethink the way we live, work, spend, save, and invest. Today's episode takes us to a quiet street in the Philadelphia neighborhood of Fairmount, so I'm just walking up to the house um, where Naomi is, and she's going to give me the bread machine. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. It's kind of heavy. That's all right. Yeah. I'm not walking far. Oh, okay, good. That's Catherine Locke. She's picking up a free bread maker, one that a neighbor, Naomi, is giving away. It make the loaves that come out are really weirdly shaped, so just... That's fine. I usually bake bread in, like, my Dutch oven, so it comes oh. out all lumpy and weird anyway, so... Yeah, okay. That's fine. <laughs> it works. Okay. Thank you so much. I that's really appreciate it. it. Okay. You're Thanks. welcome. The two met through their local Buy Nothing Facebook group. That's a neighborhood group where members give away and receive items, and we're talking all kinds of items. This is not the first thing I've gotten from Buy Nothing. I just got a great frame from somebody the other week that matched a print I haven't had framed in years, so that was perfect. She's actually someone I gave a bookcase to last year. I can't even remember. I've gotten slices of cake. One of our neighbors was test baking a lot as she was preparing to make a wedding cake. First, let's start with the main rule of Buy Nothing. Everything posted in the groups has to be a gift. It can't involve any sort of exchange of money or even be a trade. Members go to their buy nothing groups when they're looking to get rid of something and post the item with a picture, a description, and their cross streets. Like, here are four champagne flutes I never used. Would anyone like them? I'm on Henry and Fifth. Or someone posts a request, like, I need champagne glasses. Anyone? People comment if they're interested. A recipient is chosen, they arrange the details of the pickup, and that's that. The idea has proved pretty successful. Buy Nothing groups are growing fast. According to the founders, there are more than 6 million members globally. We grew by, um, well, let's see, by 4 million members in Facebook groups from 2021 to 2022. That's Liesl Clark. She's the co-founder of the Buy Nothing Project, which she started with her friend, Rebecca Rockefeller, in 2018. She says there are more than 7,000 Buy Nothing groups today, and the groups have spread all over the world. Certainly English-speaking countries, because, you know, the app and a lot of the Facebook materials are readily available in English. So in the UK and Canada and Australia, it's just spreading. So we're seeing it spreading everywhere in those countries. But our next largest grouping of communities is in Germany. Clark says the most intense growth came during the lockdown period of the pandemic. I think that people really needed that connection element. And going to a store and giving your money over to purchase an item, it actually sort of separates us. You're not really connecting with a human being in that act. Whereas in a hyper-local gift economy, you will post what you're looking for or you'll post what you have and you connect with that person. It is a one-on-one -on -one connection. The pandemic also shook up supply chains. That's in part because with so many people staying home, consumers' demands changed. You might order something and it might not show up for three, four months. So you can rely on your community and ask for that item and it may very well just be right there. And right now, because of inflation, people are really rethinking how they acquire things that they might need. There's a built-in contradiction in Buy Nothing. It's inherently about stuff, and in that sense, consumption. But Liesl Clark defines Buy Nothing as a social movement, meaning group action working toward a social goal. The goal doesn't center around the stuff itself. It centers around the mission of creating less of a certain kind of stuff. The founders of Buy Nothing both live on Bainbridge Island in Washington. 
Liesl Clark says she and Rebecca used to walk on the beach with their kids and notice how much plastic was washing ashore with the high tides. We launched a, an experiment with our kids to try to inventory those plastics and try to determine where are they coming from and what, what are they? And we concluded after pretty much a year and a half of this work, creating spreadsheets and categorizing all the plastics by, by type and shape, and we came to realize they were coming from all of us. Also, Liesl Clark is a filmmaker. She and her family spent a lot of time in a rural village in Nepal while she was working on a documentary. I had learned something from that community about gift economies. There are no stores in, in this community and people were sharing with each other. And so I brought those ideas sort of back and talked to Rebecca about, you know, asking the question, how about if we tried this in our own community? So Rebecca set up a Facebook group and we invited our friends to join us in the group and we called it Buy Nothing Bainbridge. <laughs> The idea was to create what Clark calls a similar kind of hyper-local gift economy in their own community. Will you participate in our social experiment, which basically pits you uh, with the challenge of not buying? And uh, certainly you can buy food and you can get the staples that you might need, but please come to this community and post when you're considering going to a store to buy a material item that you think you might actually not need to buy. So it was an experiment and it was successful within minutes. The idea of wasting fewer resources is also what motivates Catherine Locke to participate in her local Buy Nothing group. She's the person you heard earlier picking up a bread maker. I'm really prone to target runs that you go in for one thing and you end up with like 20 things you don't really need. I wanted to really kind of reduce my footprint as much as I could, and this felt like a neat way to do it. Locke isn't alone in feeling this way. So my name is Gaël Barguin darigue I'm a PhD student in sociology at Boston College. And my interests more broadly are in sustainable consumption and ways in which people try to reduce their consumption. So that's what got me interested in the Buy Nothing groups in the first place. Barguin darigues study, based on interviews with 50 members of a Buy Nothing group in Boston, found that producing less waste was a key motivation. So people were trying to save things from ending up in the trash. Bargan Derig found that while some people joined mainly for economic reasons, like saving money, most also had what she calls moral reasons, like reducing waste for the sake of the planet. But she also found that once people had joined, a big motivation to stay active in the group was entirely different. It was social. It gave them the sense of belonging to a friendly neighborhood community. In many cases, people didn't really establish, you know, long-lasting connections with neighbors. It's just like, for the most part, virtual connections, especially during the pandemic, where people were trying to avoid face-to-face -face interactions. But still, the fact that you're like just exchanging a couple of messages and exchanging things, this really created emotional bonds. Catherine Locke says she moved to her Philadelphia neighborhood during the pandemic and felt like it would have been difficult to connect with neighbors or get to know the area if she hadn't been part of a Buy Nothing group. Yeah, like the person I got a frame from is the person I gave a bookcase to last summer. And I was like, oh, I feel like Jessica's a friend now. Because people feel like they're part of the same community, maybe more things end up in a new home instead of in the trash. PhD student Bargan Derig says while someone might not take a mattress from the curb, even if it looks nice, they might accept one from someone in their local Buy Nothing group. That kind of fear of contamination, which people have, is lessened because of that trusting dimension. And also because, you know, people sometimes display information, details about the things they have, or they say, you know, it comes from a smoke-free, pet-free environment, etc. She says the social media aspect of Buy Nothing made it visible. A lot of users discovered the group through Facebook. And that's really where Buy Nothing differs from other platforms where people give away free stuff, like on Craigslist or even classified ads. Those platforms have a more anonymous approach to gifting. There's also FreeCycle, a website that's dedicated to the mission of giving stuff away in order to keep it out of landfills. The organization, which has existed for almost 20 years, says it has 9 million members around the world. 
it looks more like a kind of forum and it's less personable than the buy nothing groups and you don't really have that you know community feeling to it just because it's not a social media so i think the fact that it's a social media really help fostering really that that sense of community coming up does buy nothing actually lead people to lower their consumption plus how the bottom half of a toilet found a new home that's after the break Welcome back to the Best New Ideas in Money. Before the break, we heard about how buy nothing groups are growing rapidly online. So Stephanie, I'm thinking about this buy nothing stuff based on my own experiences. And I've got to tell you, it's been a little bit weird. I once did a buy nothing thing where I picked up some tomato plants. Well, they were the sorriest looking tomato plants I have ever seen. I mean, they were basically dead on arrival. In any case, I don't know if buy nothing works all the time for all the people. Yeah. I mean, I'd never heard of buy nothing until we decided to do a show on it. So I joined my local buy nothing group just to see what the fuss was about. And yeah, there's some strange stuff like two pez dispensers. I thought, who in the world is going to go out searching around and driving to go pick up two pez dispensers? I, maybe somebody will. Hold on, Stephanie. I want those pez dispensers. I mean, I actually collect oddball stuff like that. So there's an example of something that might make no sense to somebody, but boy, sign me up. I will say too that uh, and my husband if he listens to this will um will <laughs> will agree. It can be a little addictive. So you actually do have to be careful about opportunity costs in terms of how much it's worth it for you to drive across town for a $3 item or something, right? So it, it may not be worth the 45 minutes there and back. That's Lauren Hall. She's a professor and chair of the political science department at the Rochester Institute of Technology. And I'm also one of the administrators of our local buy nothing group on Facebook. I actually received a beautiful pair of Prada flats on the buy nothing page <laughs> in my size. An Ethan Allen coffee table, a couple rugs. We've actually had rugs sort of cycle in and out. We have a large buy nothing economy in various kinds of fermented foods. So kombucha scobies, um sourdough starters, various kinds of other living things. So I've I've given and received guppies and other kinds of fish. lots of garden supplies so extra seeds that people have irises ferns Hall says that as a political scientist she's fascinated by the unexpected things that happen when you're in closer contact with your neighbors like when she had to get rid of that toilet bowl So the bottom part was a working a working half of a toilet but the top part was totally cracked so you can't sort of use a half a toilet terribly effectively She had the choice of throwing it out because what other option is there? Few people go browsing Craigslist ads for half a toilet. So I was sitting there thinking to myself, this is just going to go to the curb. Like maybe I'll just see what I don't know. You know, I'll post it. Let's see what happens, right? So I posted it and I said, here's a free half of a toilet. It works. I don't know what anyone could do with this. I don't know. And I put some I put some options in the post. I said, maybe you have like a sort of whimsical planter that you would like to create, right? Or uh you're an artist or I don't know, right? And there was actually a little bit that post was interesting because there was a little bit of pushback in the comments. People were like, this isn't a place for your garbage. And I was like, you know what? It's a place for whatever people would like to try to get rid of. An engineering professor replied that she could use it for a project. Usually when you have a product, you're sort of sure somebody wants this, but I had no idea if anyone wanted this half toilet. And then she certainly didn't know that she when she woke up this morning, she didn't know that she wanted a half toilet. Like nobody actually wakes up in the morning and says like I would I really need a half toilet today. So buy nothing helps with the logistics of getting stuff from one person to another. That saves some stuff from going into the trash. In other instances it might cut out the middleman like a charitable organization that would otherwise have redistributed donated items. But PhD student Bargan Derig says there's one important way by nothing is very different from traditional charity. The givers and the receivers are not two separate groups. It's just, you know, it's the same people. 
The socioeconomic dynamics of secondhand items are usually that the more affluent give stuff away and the less affluent receive it. In Buy Nothing, the groups are organized by neighborhood, which often means people are swapping their things with others of similar status. But Bargan de Rigue points out that this is where the social aspect that connects the groups can be a little problematic. When you give to your neighbors, the geographical boundaries of a neighborhood become very important. It's the negative side of, you know, having groups functioning at, at a neighborhood level, especially in a, in a country like the U.S., where, I mean, people are, are so geographically segregated. In an effort to make the project more equitable, the Buy Nothing founders have created a free app. It allows users to choose the area where they want to share. The app is also a solution for members who don't want to participate using Facebook. Time will tell whether members will move over to the app. So far, the founders say 400,000 people have joined the new platform. Another question is whether Buy Nothing actually does make people lower their consumption. So far, Bargan de Rigue's study indicates that people in these groups did buy fewer new things, but mostly among the lower income groups participating. The more affluent bought the same amount of new things. Liesl Clark, who co-founded Buy Nothing, emphasizes that the idea isn't to never buy anything, but participating could influence what kind of stuff you buy and where. Yes, we called it Buy Nothing because initially we launched it as a social experiment to challenge our friends and neighbors to, to just try not to buy things that they might normally buy, especially from the big box stores, especially the things that are mass produced, especially the single use plastics. She said they've done surveys and polls and buy nothing groups asking people how they've changed their spending habits. And we found resoundingly that yes, people are saving money, but what are they doing with it? They're spending it. They're putting it right back into their local economy. So they might not be spending at the big kind of massive conglomerate type franchises, but they are spending it on the local businesses because they're coming to know the people who own those businesses through their buy nothing communities. So they come to know, oh, you're the person who owns the local bakery? Oh, well, I'm definitely gonna go in there and buy there. So that was sort of the end result is that we found that, well, it's not that people are saving money and the money's not getting back out into the economy. It actually is, but it's supporting the local economies. Thanks for listening to The Best New Ideas in Money. You can subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. If you like what you heard, please leave us a review. And if you have ideas for future episodes, drop us a line at bestnewideasinmoney at marketwatch.com. Thanks to Catherine Locke, Lisa Clark, Gael bargan and Lauren Hall. To learn more about other ways people are spending and saving, head to marketwatch.com. I'm Stephanie Kelton. And I'm Charles Passy. The Best New Ideas in Money is a podcast for MarketWatch, produced by Best Case Studios. Suzanne Myers is our producer. Our associate producer is Hannah Leibowitz Lockard. The executive producer for Best Case Studios is Adam Pincus. For MarketWatch, Melissa Haggerty is the executive producer, and the producers are Meta Lutz Hoft and Katie Ferguson, who also mix this episode. Jeremy Binks is our news editor. The Best New Ideas in Money theme was composed by Sam Retzer. Stephanie Kelton is an economist and professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University and not part of the MarketWatch newsroom. We'll be back next week with another new idea.